Comrades, as uh, John pointed out, the purpose of this school is to discuss and learn from the events that took place 100 years ago. 1917, for us, was the greatest single event in human history. It was a date that changed history. But of course, there are other dates which change history. Dates which marked a fundamental change in the whole situation. 1914 was such a date. 1917 was such a date. 1929, the Wall Street crash was such a date. Then you had 1933, the rise of Hitler. 1939, the beginning of the Second World War. 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union which was, of course, a dramatic event that changed the, the, the course of history, yes. And at that time, the bourgeoisie and its echoes in the labor movement, the reformists, were euphoric. They talked about the end of socialism, the end of communism, the end of Marxism, of course. But then they've been talking about the end of Marxism every year for the last 150 years. <laughs> We're still here. Yes, and one of these gentlemen, Francis Fukuyama, actually spoke of the end of history. Now, of course, what he meant was not that history itself had finished. That would have been a piece of stupidity that even a stupid man like Fukuyama wouldn't, couldn't believe. What he meant was something else. What he meant is that with the collapse of the Soviet Union, which of course was not socialism at all, it had nothing to do with socialism. It was a bureaucratic and totalitarian caricature of socialism. That certainly collapsed. It deserved to collapse. It inevitably collapsed. As Trotsky explained as early as 1936 in the revolution betrayed. But these gentlemen, these, oh, let's not forget the ladies. These ladies and gentlemen of the bourgeoisie were convinced that socialism was finished forever and therefore it would logically follow that the only possible system that can exist is capitalism otherwise known as the free market economy oh yes my friends 1991 was one of those deciding uh, turning points of world history. But you know, my dear friend and comrade and teacher Ted Grant, said at the time, seen in retrospect, in the future, the fall of Stalinism the fall of the Berlin Wall will be seen as only the prelude 
to a far greater crisis, a far bigger drama, which will be the collapse of capitalism itself. Now, 20 years is not a long time, is a long time in the life of a man or a woman. For many comrades in this room, for the majority of you, that's a whole lifetime, 20 years. For someone like me, I don't think I've got 20 years left. I might, might with a bit of luck. Yes, it seems a long time. And many comrades became demoralized and disoriented by this period. But in the annals of history, in the, in the historical record, 20 years are nothing. Nothing. A tiny fragment in the colossal pageant of human history. And in the history of the class struggle. It's nothing. And within the space of this short space of time, 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, or there, thereabouts, not one stone upon another remains of the perspectives of the bourgeoisie at that time. They talked about a world of peace. And there's war after war after war. Terrorism, which is spreading like an uncontrolled epidemic. And by the way, from a, from a scientific point of view, from a Marxist point of view, terrorism, it expresses fundamental contradictions which cannot be solved. It's a symptom. It's a symptom of a disease. And this is a disease system. And so we come to another decisive date in, in world history. 2008 when a in a matter of months, in a matter of days, the whole in, in, unstable edifice collapsed. The entire edifice of the world financial system, capitalist system collapsed. And ever since that time, almost 10 years ago, the bourgeoisie of all countries have been struggling to get out of this crisis. We said at the time that this crisis destroyed the equilibrium of the capitalist system. And ever since, all the governments of the world have been struggling to restore the economic equilibrium. which they have not succeeded in doing. We'll talk about a recovery. Every day you read this in the press, you hear it on the television, oh, there's a recovery, there's a recovery. There is no recovery, no, no real recovery. To the degree, to the very limited degree, that you can speak of a very partial recovery in the United States, for example. You would have to say that this is the weakest economic recovery in the history of, of, of the world. Even in the 1930s, there was a bigger recovery than this. And we also added, 
this is almost 10 years ago that we said this all the attempts of the bourgeoisie to, to restore the economic equilibrium will destroy the social and political equilibrium and that is an absolute fact you can see this now we, we, we will see this in the course of the, the discussion today everywhere you look the attempts of the, of, the, of, the, of the governments to impose austerity in a desperate attempt to get, to get the economy moving which they have failed to do after 10 years almost 10 years in every single country without exception there are social and political explosions of an absolutely unprecedented character oh yes it's what we said at the time the desperate attempts to restore the economic equilibrium have destroyed the social and political equilibrium in one country after another Now, I don't want to spend too much time on economics, which we've discussed many times in the past. Although, as Lenin said, politics is concentrated economics. And in the last analysis, all of these uh, political and social crises are a reflection of the, in, the economic impasse of capitalism which is no longer capable of developing the productive forces as it did in the past and by the way be careful about that I am not saying and Marx never said and Trotsky never said and Lenin never said that there was an absolute ceiling on the development of the productive forces under capital capitalism. That's false. That's false. There can be some development of the productive forces. As, as they have been in China in the last period. But it's nothing like the kind of development you had over the last half century since the second world war and the reason why they're in such a mess is because in the previous period 30, 40, 50 years the capitalist system went beyond its limits For example, through the expansion of credit. All that credit does is to expand the market beyond its natural limits. You overcome overproduction, and overproduction is always the basis of every real crisis, as Karl Marx pointed out. You can overcome overproduction by, by extending credit. In other words, spending money that you do not have. Nothing new in that. It was, it was true in Marx's day. But the extent of it, the, the, the vast character of this uh, expansion of credit... what Ted used to call vo voodoo economics magic you get money for no magic it, you know th th this uh, it itself ca causes enormous uh, uh, enormous problems 
Marx pointed out even in the Communist Manifesto that the bourgeoisie solves the crisis today only by causing bigger crises in the future. Now, if you ask yourself the question, what have they achieved in the last eight years? With colossal austerity, colossal pain and suffering. To do what? To pay the deficit, to pay the debts. Huge debts, huge debts. Unparalleled debts. A mountain of debts. It makes the Alps look like a small a molehill. These debts are ten times bigger than Mount Everest. As a result of the previous period, the big banks went bust, or they were going to go bust. And they were only saved by the intervention of the state. Saved them by giving billions, trillions of public money. The only problem is the state does not have any money. The state hasn't got a beam. And therefore, the whole burden of this, therefore, all they've done is to convert a gigantic black hole in the private, fine, in the private sector, in the banks. They saved the banks, wonderful. At the cost of creating a huge black hole in the public finances. And who pays? I'll give you three guesses who pay. The working class must pay. The unemployed must pay. The people who are sick must pay. The, the schools must pay. Everyone must pay. Except for the rich. Who become richer and richer and richer. These parasites even in the last ten years. Has this solved anything? Let me give you some figures. I won't bore you with too many figures. This comrade Fred kindly gave me the other day. The percentage of, of G, GDP debt is as follows. The highest indebted country in the world as a percentage of GDP is Japan. 248% of the GDP is debt. Canada seems a nice stable country, doesn't it? Just you wait. Canada's number 19, not so bad, you might think. Yeah. It's only debt in Canada is only 91% of GDP, that's all. France is number 15, 97%. Spain is number 13, 99%. Spain, you're almost there, you're almost there. USA is already there. 106%. Although actually I think the total debt, if you include all the debts, it's more like, how much would it be? It's about 300%, isn't it? Yes, I think the total debts, private, public, corporate, public, is 300% of GDP in America. So American capitalism is sitting on a mountain of debt. Trouble with the mountain, trouble with the mountain, sooner or later there's an avalanche. Ask, ask the Italian and Swiss comrades. 
Italy 133%. Although I understand now they've reduced the figure somewhat through, through tricks. And Greece 178%. Let's, let's be clear about this. There is no way that these countries can get out of the crisis. None at all. Unless and until these debts have been wiped out, one way or another. And how do you eliminate the public debt? I've already said it. You put all the burden on the poorest sections of society. Now, you know, some people over the last eight years, ten years, have asked me many times, but where's the revolution? Where's the revolution? When's this going to happen? Uh, To this question, I can give you an absolutely accurate answer. When are the workers going to move? Shall I tell you? I'll give you an absolutely scientific answer. The working class will move when it is ready. Not one moment before and not one moment after. Human consciousness, if you understand dialectical materialism, contrary to what the idealists think, is not a progressive thing. It's very profoundly conservative. Certainly it's not revolutionary. People are not naturally revolutionary. People are frightened of change. You know that. They're scared of change. They cling to the familiar, what they know. Familiar ideas, familiar parties, familiar leaders, familiar religion. It's it's a form of of self-preservation. Goes back to the days when we lived in caves. Although we never really lived in caves, that's another matter, but there we are. We spent some time in caves. But you see, uh, people are frightened of change. And they will only accept the idea of change. Consciousness will change on the basis of great events which shake up society, shake up consciousness, and force people to begin to think of reality, to see things as they really are. And that doesn't happen gradually. It happens in an explosive way. And that's precisely what you see now. Everywhere. Consciousness is beginning to catch up with a bang. And you have some really unprecedented situations. Even in the United States. Which is the, 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 the wealthiest, uh, most successful, most, most powerful capitalist country that ever existed. And yet in the, in, in the United States, I'm sure the American Commons will speak on this. The the standard of living of the American workers has not increased for how long, John? 20, 30? 40 years, Sir John says. There's been no real increase in living standards. Yes. And for most people, living standards have gone down. Everywhere, in all countries, this generation of young people is the first generation since 1945 that cannot expect a a better living standard than their parents. Everywhere. 
Every generation since 94 have there's been a, a, a big increase. At least in the advanced capitalist countries. The, the so called third world is a different matter. But not anymore. It is finished. It is finished. And there's no way that they can recover it. The American dream is dead. Instead of the American dream, you've got the American nightmare. Yes, there's a change in consciousness in, in America. Which was clearly revealed in the last elections. Now, just, just think. For a hundred years, the political stability of American capitalism was based upon these two parties. Although my favorite American writer, Gore Vidal, I think he put it, he put it very well when he said, our republic, that's America, our republic has one party, the property party, with two right wings, Democrats and Republicans. And for a hundred years they would, they would change, they would be this, they would alternate. Democrats would face Republicans, Republicans would face Democrats. And nothing fundamentally changed. Yes, but now there's a change. You see, you saw the desire for a change. Previous, in the vote for Obama, that was quite significant. Obama was a black man. But he promised a change. Demagogically, he promised a change. And people in America didn't use to vote, but they were queuing up to vote for a change. And there was no change. And therefore there's a mood of anger and bitterness and frustration. Particularly among the, the poorest sections. Which you saw, by the way, reflected in, in the campaign of Bernie, Sa Bernie Sanders. Nobody knew B Bernie Sanders. Hardly anybody knew Bernie Sanders. But he put forward, in words at least, quite a radical program. He talked about a, revolu a political revolution against the, the billionaire class. We know it's just words. Yes, but the masses don't understand that. They don't see it like They don't see it with our eyes. And there were mass, massive meetings of tens of hundreds of thousands. To support Bernie Sanders. And incidentally, it's quite, quite possible that if Bernie Sanders had stood against uh, Trump... I think there must be some studies to this effect, are there, John? Yes, there are at least one study says that he could have won. But of course he was removed, he was bumped naturally by the Democrat Party. And worse than that, he accepted it. It's caused a certain element of demoralization. But many people said, many people who would have voted Bernie Sanders said, okay, if we can't have Sanders, we'll vote for Trump. Who is, of course, he's, the man is a rabid reactionary. And ever so slightly deranged. Not entirely, not entirely. In, in the words of Shakespeare, Though this be madness, yet there's method in it. The ruling class did not want Trump. The ruling class does not want Trump. 
And they mobilized everything to stop him. Because he's what we call, I don't know if you can translate this, he's a maverick. He's uh, uncon- uncontrollable. And the, the, the ruling class like to have people that they can control. Like Hillary Clinton. You know, vote for me, I'm a woman. You know that? Yes. Vote for me, I'm a woman. Yeah, Theresa, Theresa May is a woman. Margaret Thatcher, I believe, was a woman. <laughs> Not quite sure. Angela Merkel is a woman. I d- didn't notice any improvement in the lives of the women of Germany and, uh, and Britain under these people. Hillary Clinton is an agent of, of big business, that's all. And Trump, Trump demagogically even appealed to the workers. I think for the first time he used the word working class, he's never been heard of. Even the most left wing liberals in the States, they refer to the middle class. We're all middle class. You know. Pardon? Even Sanders also spoke of the middle class. Yeah. Trump actually appealed to the working class, to the miners and so on, you know. Look, you're, you're oppressed, you're exploited by the establishment. What are you going to do? But what is, what is astonishing is that all the media were against him. I think he was supported by one newspaper. I don't think it was a national paper either. I don't, I don't know how he did this, but even, he even alienated Fox News, which is ultra-right wing. He even stepped on their toes. Now, just think, how many times have you heard this? People are arguing against revolution, against Marxism. Oh, you can't, you can't have revolution. Look, we've got the mass media against us. The media is against us. Yes. The media is a very powerful instrument, no doubt about it. But what happened in the US here was extraordinary. The whole of the media was viciously against Trump, attacking, attacking him all the time. The ruling class was against him. The Democrats, of course, were against him. And the majority of the Republican Party was against him, if the truth is to be told. And he won. He won. This is astonishing. This is a political earthquake. How do you explain it? Well, there's a very simple explanation, of course. Which now the ruling class and the Democrats and the Republicans are plugging all the time. It's the Russians. <laughs> the Russians. If Trump, if Trump wins the elections, it's because of the Russians. Sorry about the accent, George. <laughs> if the weather's bad, if it rains, it's the Russians. If you wake up in the morning and there's a pimple on your ass, it's the Russians. It, become, it becomes a circus. And one, there was one English conservative, a right winger, when he was asked about this business of the Russians, he says, he says no, that's all nonsense. All that proves to me is that to this day, the Democrat Party have not understood why Trump won the elections. And uh, you could say in a reactionary way, yes. In a reactionary, very distorted way, peculiar way. Donald Trump reflected the anger of, of, of millions of ordinary people, working class people and others. 
against the existing conditions, against the existing system, against what he calls the establishment. Of course we know that's nonsense. And in, in, in experience, experience will show, will show the masses that it's nonsense. And there will be big movements against this government in the next period. Actually, the movements have already begun. Yes, immediately after the, the election of Trump. Immediately. There were mass demonstrations in every American city. The Women's March, I think I, I, think I read some, it was the biggest uh, political protest in American history. Pardon? Yes, when he was inaugurated, the, the weekend he was uh, confirmed. And that's only, the, that's only the beginning, my friends. That's only the beginning. Just, just you wait. It's a myth which many left-wingers in Europe have accepted. That the American people are reactionary, they're, they're right-wing, they will never support socialism. It's uh, completely untrue, by the way. Can you remember the figures of that uh, poll that was given for young people? Uh, I, think I, I think I remember the figures. There was a poll which was taken before the Sanders campaign really got, uh, got, got going. Asking young people, I think, of under 30 or under 25 years of age, in America, would you vote for a, for a socialist president? I think the result was 67%, wasn't it? I think the result was 67% said yes. Yes. And as John reminded me, 9% said they'd vote for communism. They'd vote for a communist president. You're talking about millions and millions of young Americans. Yes, but the uh, bourgeois article that I, I, I read about this. Is it, yes, yes, but don't worry. Don't, don't worry, there's no danger. Because the same poll asked Americans above 65 years of age. Would you vote for a socialist president? And only 34% said yes. 34% of Americans over the age of 65 would vote for a socialist president. That's even more incredible than the other figure. After, after, after decades and decades of uh, 100 years in effect of vicious propaganda against communism, against socialism, which is said to be the same, The fact that the fact that 34 percent of older Americans said they would vote for yes, they'd vote for a socialist. That's that itself represents a striking change in consciousness. Now, before you get too excited, I should perhaps give a word of caution. Am I saying that? Uh, the red flag is going to be hoisted over the White House in the next six months. And the anniversary of the October Revolution will see the, 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 the uh, declaration of, of the American Soviet Republic. No, no comments. I'm not saying that. Not yet. Not saying that. What I am saying, and I say it with absolute conviction, is that something profound has changed and is changing in American society. And by the way, not just on the bottom. Just think, the political situation now in, in America has no precedent in history. 
It's unprecedented. An elected president is in a direct confrontation with the big section of the state, with the majority of the state. With the media? With the FBI? With the CIA? With all of the secret services? Banging Russia, 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 Russia. They're trying to get rid of him. I don't think they will succeed, but they're trying to. It's a serious attempt. What does it mean? Here is an open split, an open split in the state. It's a crisis. It's not a political crisis. It's a crisis of the regime. And and by the way, the CIA and so on, these secret services, same as secret services everywhere, they don't like to be in the public eye. They don't like to intervene in politics, at least not openly, not openly. Secretly they intervene all the time. But this is, it's it's, it's incredible that the the, the machinations and the intrigues of the CIA are being paraded publicly before the eyes of millions of Americans. Unprecedented. Astonishing. And incidentally, since we're discussing revolution this week, revolutions do not start at the bottom. Historically, revolution starts at the top. And start precisely with a split in the ruling class, a split at the top. That's always the case. So we must follow events in the United States very, very closely. Now I have to choose my comments carefully. I won't say much about China, except to point out China, of course, had a, the Chinese economy had a colossal development of the productive forces in the last 30 years or 40 years. That was the main thing, one of the main things, that stopped the economic crisis developing into a deep slump. China actually kept the world economy afloat for for about 20 or 30 years. But that has reached its limits now. Growth in China sharply decreased. It's now less than 7%. Although in the last 12 months it's stabilized a bit, but it's still very low. By Chinese standards, that's too low, very low. And although China has got a colossal trade surplus... I think it's 200 billion dollars if I don't, if my memory doesn't fail me. Which is one of the reasons why Trump is always attacking China. Because he complains that the Chinese have got this huge uh, surplus and the Americans uh, want, want a slice. What, the figure that's not generally publicized... I mentioned debt, debt. Chinese public debt at the moment is more than Japan and it's actually 300% of GDP. And the serious bourgeois are worried about this because there can be a financial collapse in China Which would, and that would have a devastating effect on the world economy. And by the way, there's an, China can no, can no longer export. That's the problem. 
It's really very simple. If Europe and America are not consuming as they did in the past, China cannot produce because they need to export. Export or die. And if China's not producing, then Argentina, Brazil, Australia, and other countries, Chile and so on, cannot export their uh, raw materials to China. So you see here a, a global crisis of the capitalist system. I won't talk about North Korea. Who knows what Fat Boy is going to do? I don't know what he's going to do. Who knows what he's going to do? <laughs> Except to say that uh, this uh, little incident exposes the weakness of American imperialism, doesn't it? It exposes the weakness, the limits of American imperialism. Donald Trump huffs and he puffs and he shouts and he curses and bangs the table walks out of the room. He, he's even nice to the Chinese. Things must be coming desperate. He was nice to the Chinese leader. You gotta do something about North Korea. Sorry, John. <laughs> and the Chinese leader says, yes, yes, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, okay. And then does nothing. Because the Chinese won't do anything that will upset that regime. Because if it collapses, that's a big problem for China, which, which they don't want. So Donald Trump is forced to resort to tweets again. Tweets, tweets, tweets. I told the Chinese to do something, they haven't done anything. Tweet, tweet, tweet. <laughs> Doesn't make any difference. So, anyway, I think we better proceed to Europe. Which, which is, of course, is the... Uh, it should be the main source of our... The main uh, circus, or center, rather, of our attention. Not because Asia and Latin America and Africa are not important. They're extremely important. But in the last period, the center of gravity of the class struggle has moved from Latin America, where it's not finished by any means, I'm not saying that, but there are more poten there's more potential for revolution in Europe at the present time. And Europe is in crisis. I mean, I don't know. I think the, the, the bourgeois is very Im, Im, empir, empir, empirical, very impressionist. Because the European economy seems to have stabilized a little bit. And there's a little bit of growth, not much. One point something, I don't know. A bit more in Germany. The euro crisis seems to be solved. The Euro crisis, my dear friends, is not solved. And then they have Brexit. British are leaving. You know, the, the rats leaving a sinking ship. And uh, they're going to have, the, the Brits are going to have a rough time, a very rough time. You know, they, they, there's an ancient saying of the ancient Greeks. He who the gods wish to destroy, they first make them mad. The British Bulls would have gone mad, they're crazy, they're bonkers. They made a mess of everything. They had a referendum because they thought they would lose. They didn't think people were going to vote to leave. 
That was a political earthquake. Everyone was stunned. Everyone, when the result came. We voted to leave the, the European Union. People were stunned. I think the, the people that were most stunned were the advocates of Brexit. They never thought they were going to win. Therefore, they have no plans, no strategy, no idea, no nothing. There's a photograph that came out about a week ago. Sometimes photographs speak louder than words, you know. The negotiations of Brexit have begun. And there's a, a, big, a big table. The Europeans on the one side. The expression on their faces reminded me of hungry crocodiles preparing to devour a little, a little lamb. On the European side, they all had piles of papers on the table. Then on the British side, there were the British representatives. David Davis, poor chap. Grinning for the camera to conceal their nervousness. And on their side of the table, there was absolutely nothing. That picture was put out deliberately. That was deliberate, putting that out. They have, and of course, the Europeans, the British had actually had the stupid idea. They were just going to walk away from Europe and everything would be nice and they'd have markets everywhere. <laughs> the Europeans under, they didn't show what they had under the table. They only showed the notes on top of the table. Under the table, one of them had a knife. The other one had a hatchet. And the main negotiator had a chainsaw. They, the British are going to have the shock of their lives. Even if Frau Merkel... Even if Merkel and the others wanted to be nice to the British. They cannot. Because if they do that, it will encourage others to leave. Therefore, this is going to be a catastrophe. This is going to be a big mess. But I read an article in the British newspaper when I was traveling over here with this famous photograph which said the following okay the Britain's going to have a rough time and the Europeans think they're very clever but look at the real situation in Europe look at the real position in the Eurozone and very soon they will not be laughing at all they'll be weeping Nothing has been solved. What's been solved in Greece? After a decade of terrible austerity, terrible and indescribable suffering, poverty, misery. Last time I was in Greece, I was having dinner in the house of a, a former comrade. Nice man. He said, Alan, you, you can't believe, you can't believe the situation in this country. You wouldn't believe it. Every day people are committing suicide. Old people are committing suicide. In this block of flats, two people have committed suicide. Where I live. Desperate crisis. Of course, there have been mass strikes, general strikes. The, the Greeks voted massively for Syriza, which was nothing. 
It was nothing serious. The Socialist Party collapsed. The Basok collapsed. Because of their betrayal, because of their participation in governments of cuts. And Tsipras was the most popular man in Greece. He held a referendum. I think he thought he was going to lose it. I think that's why he said. Should we accept the terms dictated by Frau Merkel and the others? And there was a massive response of Orchi, no! Mass support, not just the workers, but the middle class, the taxi drivers, the peasants, the small businessmen. And here we come to the question of the subjective factor. Which is decisive. Everywhere the masses are looking for a change and demanding a change. And the only problem is, it's only one problem, only one problem. They need to find an expression, an organized political expression for this anger. And there is no expression. The people that ought to be their leaders, the labor politicians, the social democrats, yes, and the so-called ex-communists, with just an, another version of the social de democratic reformists. Above all, the disgusting trade union leaders, Who do not don't want to fight for, for, uh, fight against austerity and fight for the cause of the workers. I think even in America they've done a deal with Trump, haven't they? The, the trade union leaders. Yes, in in the states, the trade so-called leaders of the unions have done a deal with with uh, Trump to betray the workers. But in spite of everything, in, in Greece there is this mass response, huge demonstrations. And Tsipras, you need to understand the subjective factor, would only have had to lift his little finger, that's all. There, and there would be no more capitalism in Greece. He could have expropriated the lot, the bankers, the ship magnet, magnets, everybody and say, we are not going to pay one single euro to, to, to these gangsters. Enough. We'll take the power into, their own, uh, into our own hands and we will appeal to the workers of Spain, of Italy, of Portugal, yes, and Germany and Britain to follow our example. Let's have a genuine Europe, a socialist Europe, a democratic Europe, not a Europe of the banks. And you know what the response would have been? Cyprus would have got 100% support. The people would have been dancing in the streets. And I'll tell you, the people would be prepared to make sacrifices. They'd be, prepared to, they'd be prepared to take wage cuts. They'd be prepared to face hunger, if necessary, on one condition. That they are convinced that they're fighting for a just cause. And that there's genuine equality, not, not one law for the rich and one law for the poor. Unfortunately, Tsipras is not a Marxist, he's a reformist, and therefore, of course, he, he, he didn't, uh, did, didn't, the idea didn't enter his head to base himself on the power of the masses. And therefore, he betrayed. He signed an agreement, he, he pulled his trousers down, excuse my Welsh. 
pulled his trousers down. Surrendered. And he signed a deal far worse than the deal that was originally uh, proposed. Leading to a colossal demoralization. Huge defeats for Syriza. Although he's still there because there's no alternative. Comrades, this is the importance of leadership, the importance of the subjective factor. Of course, every person in Greece knows who really controls the EU. The bankers, the bureaucrats and the capitalists. And particularly German capitalism. Originally the, the European Union was dominated by two countries, France and Germany. The French bourgeois had big ideas. That they were going to dominate Europe politically and militarily. And the Germans could dominate it economically. Didn't last very long. There is nobody now that doubts. Nobody doubts. That it's the German ruling class that dominates Europe completely. Utterly. Economic muscle is, is decisive. And the German, the, the, the German ruling class, they really show the real face of capitalism. Marx describes this in Capital. And there's a very good book on Marx's Capital. It's just got written by my friend uh, Adam Booth, which will be on sale <laughs> very soon, I'm told. End of commercial. And uh, Marx describes that when there's, a sl you see, when, the when there's a boom, credit is easy. You want a loan? Take a loan. You want to buy a house? Buy it. Here's the money. You haven't got enough money? Have some more money. Easy money. Everyone can have a... That's what they said to the Greeks. The Germans said that to the Greeks and to the Italians and to the Spanish. And they said, oh, very good, very good. Let's have some more. Yes. But when there's a, when, when there's a crisis, Marx explains, when there's a crisis... It changes into its opposite. Then you have the, the real face of capital, the real ugly face of capitalism. Primitive capitalism. Original capitalism. The ugly face of the usurer, the moneylender. Pay me. Pay me what you owe. Pay me now. You haven't got any money. Sell your furniture. You sold your furniture, sell your house. You sold your house, sell your wife and kids. Pay me. It's like the figure of a Shylock in Shakespeare's Merchants of Venice. Once his pound of flesh, give me the pound of flesh. That's how they're behaving to the Greeks. To this day they behave like to, to the Greeks. But of course this has consequences. In the form that you get an enormous development of class hatred. Of class polarization. In all countries of Europe. And the big problem that the ruling class fa faces is this. Like in the States, John. What is the problem? Why, are they so, why do they hate Trump? Why do they hate him? Because he's exposed this circus of Democrats and Republicans. He's destroyed the consensus. And therefore, it, 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 there's the collapse of the center. The collapse of the center. 
the collapse of liberalism. I've come to the conclusion, John, recently. I hate the liberals. I hate them. Possibly, I hate them even more than I hate the reactionaries. I hate them. They're, they're only, a liberal is only a reactionary in disguise. That's all. That's the most dangerous form of reaction. But it's the same. The political center is collapsing everywhere. That's the problem. That they, that's dangerous. That's a reflection of a class polarization. There is a polarization. You will see it on this political instability. Where before there was stability. You see this in the elections. Everywhere in the elections. One shock after another. Political earthquakes. Things that were not supposed to happen are now happening. And therefore, this will be a period, it is a period, it is a period of sudden shocks and changes in the situation, which affects all countries without exception. Therefore, we must be prepared for big changes, which can happen quicker than what you think. It reflects, uh, and you see it in the, in the election instability. The, 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 the sharp, sharp shifts, sharp swings to the left and to the right. And to the, must be prepared for that. If the left, if the left wing betrays, disappoints the workers, There can be a lot of abstentionism, people don't vote, and there can be a, a move to the right. Which in turn only will prepare pre pre bigger swings to the left. Look, look at the recent elections in France. They were terrified of the rapid rise of the National Front of Le Pen. By the way, Le Pen is not a fascist. That's nonsense. It's nothing, it's nothing like the movements of Hitler and Mussolini before the war. Nothing like it. She's a reactionary uh, uh, chauvinist and, 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 and racist and so on. So that's true, but she's not a fascist. Yes, but what about the rise of Mélenchon? They don't talk about that. That shows in France the development of a, of, of, of a polarization between left and right. By the way, Mélenchon, I think he got about 20% coming from nothing. And he could have defeated Le Pen as a matter of fact. He could have defeated Le Pen. Except for one thing. The criminal stupidity of the so-called Trotskyists in France, so-called left parties in France. Criminal. Instead of giving critical support to Mélenchon, which is what they should have done. Or, in the French system, you can do, you can do something else. You stand up, uh, you stand in the first round, Put your revolutionary program forward as propaganda and having done that, make your case clear, you withdraw in the second round in favor of Mélenchon. It's what they should have done. They didn't do that because they're criminal, disgusting sectarians. 
Every comrade in this, this room must understand that this, this international, a genuine Marxist, Leninist, Trotskyist international, we fight against the capitalist class, against the bourgeois. We fight against the reformists, both the right and the left varieties. We fight against the Stalinists. But also, we will have nothing to do with the so-called Trotskyist sex. Nothing. It's an absolute scandal that these people should call themselves Trotskyists. Scandal. And they disgrace the name of Trotskyism everywhere in the eyes of the working class. If you add up the votes, the, the, the votes of these wretched parties, I think there are about four of them, small parties. Those votes made the difference between Mélenchon winning or losing against Le Pen. He could have won if it wasn't for this betrayal. He lost, unfortunately. If he would have won, then in the final election, it, it would not have been uh, uh, Mélenchon against this other... What, what is the idiot's name? The, pardon? Uh, I beg your pardon. It was Macron against the other chap. What's the other chap's name? Not Le Pen, no. Pardon? No, 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 no. In, in the final round, it was... Uh, Macron versus versus Le Pen. That's right. Versus Le Pen. I'm sorry. It's very early in the morning for me. Yes, uh, it, it would it would be Mélenchon against Macron, and that would have changed everything. That would have changed everything. Anyway, it didn't happen. Macron won. Nice man handsome man, young man, big smile, nice suit, well educated. The centre, le centre, le centre, vive le centre. The centre won, everybody so happy. Frau Merkel was happy. London was happy. Italy was happy. France was happy. Everybody was happy. Yes, you know, you know what this center is? It is a gigantic zero. Macron does not stand for anything new, that's a lie. This banker, he's a banker by the way. And his, his, his program is a form, a form of reforms. That means cuts. I, I like the way they use language these ways, John, you know. It's like George Orwell's 1984. You know 1984? There's the, the, the Ministry of Peace, which was the Ministry of War. The Ministry of Plenty, which is the Ministry of Scarcity. And my favorite, the Ministry of Love, the Secret Police. But they use this language, oh, the center, the center. There's nothing center about it. What do you mean center? No, you, know, you, know, you know how they use language, you know? Up, down. Up, down. Black, white. North, south. Left. Moderates. <laughs> true, isn't it? Anyway, he will expose himself. He wants to change the labor law to make, uh, to make, uh, make it easier to sack workers. You know. Now, you know, there's one thing. By the way, you know the party that really won the, the election? They say, Macron 
Il y a de et, 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 a majorité absolue, une absolue majorité. Excuse my accent, Jérôme. Absolute majority. He didn't have an absolute majority. The absolute majority were the abstentions, wasn't it? 70%. It was about 70% of people's preference, not voting for anybody. You know, the, yes, and this silent majority, this 70%, will not be silent for long. The French people, a third said this the other day, and he's right, have revolution in their blood. They will take to the streets. Predict that now. You, you're, going to see, you're going to see the biggest demonstrations you've seen in France. Strikes and general strikes. So Monsieur Macron... Or should I say Monsieur Macron? It's a rude word in French, actually. Macron. It's not going to last. But the French comrades can say about that. Ah, let's go back to Germany for a moment. Germany has got uh, the power. And it's immediately come into conflict. Guess who? The United States of America. Donald Trump and Frau Merkel are not on very good terms. You see, why, are they, why, are they, why don't they speak? Why don't they like each other? It's not personal. Donald Trump's slogan is Make America Great Again. America first. This means, translated into plain English, make America great at the expense of the rest of the world. Make America great at the expense of China. Make America great at the expense of Europe in general. And Germany in particular. Germany is the victim of its own success. German capitalism has been very successful exporting its products. Which, by the way, shows the stupidity of its demand for austerity in the rest of Europe. Because that's reducing the market for German exports, actually. And uh, that eventually will hit German capitalism. But at the moment they're not doing too badly. They're doing rather well. They have a huge trade surplus. Which is the biggest in the world. Oh yes. They don't talk about it. That's a fact. If I'm not mistaken, in, 19, in 2016, it was $300 billion. Not bad. Trade surplus. But, you know, you don't have to be a genius at arithmetic to know one man's, they say in English, one man's meat is another man's poison. In economics, one country's trade surplus is another country's trade deficit. Incidentally, China's got a big trading surplus. It's $200 billion, which is $100 billion less than Germany. Now, Mr. Trump who's not entirely stupid, can add up, and he sees this, this, this figure, and he doesn't like it. And he tells Frau Merkel that he doesn't like it. 
and she'd better do something about it. And since he's not a very diplomatic man, he actually said publicly, he intends to cut, if the Germans don't do something, I will cut the import of German cars into the United States. Very dangerous talk. Because if he continues, if he continues down that road, that is a recipe for a trade war. The Germans would retaliate immediately, blocking American goods. And you know, the, the world economy is in a very fragile state. The world economy is in a fragile state. What you, and what you must remember, what caused the Great Depression before the, the Second World War? was not the Wall Street crash of 1929, that started it. It was protectionist policies being, being pursued by all countries. What protectionism is, is the export of unemployment. Trump says, I want more jobs in America. Jobs for Americans. That means less jobs for the Germans, the Chinese, and others. You, you notice, by the way, Trump recently went to, po to Poland, where there was re an enthusiastic response. The problem with Europe now is it really, they don't agree on anything. The European countries don't agree on anything. There's big tensions between the Eastern Europeans and Germany. That's why Donald Trump went to Poland. And what was his next stop? What was his next visit? Paris, of course. But again, Macron made on a big celebration. He wants to drive a wedge between France and Germany. And uh, of course, uh, Macron is very pleased to receive him. Lean on the Americans to put pressure on the Germans. And of course, above everything else, there's the problem of Brexit, which I've already mentioned. Even the future of the Europe is not uh, clear that it can, it not, it's not clear that it can survive. The European banking system is uh, in a very uh, disastrous state. Huge debts propped up with the assistance of Mario Draghi and the European Central Bank. That cannot continue because ultimately you know who pays the money into the European Central Bank. The Germans and they don't like it. They don't want to prop up the countries of Southern Europe. In Italy by the way, there's been a banking crisis, here there's been a big banking crisis. Italian banks are mainly bankrupt. There was the, the oldest bank in the world, what's it called? The Monte de Pietà di Siena? Yes, yeah, something like that, I forgot. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm referring to. It was bankrupt. Now, according to the rules of the European Union, national governments are not allowed to subsidize banks. But this is Italy. <laughs> so they subsidize the bank, they save the bank. Then there were two other banks 
It's Veneto and what's the other one? Vicenza, what's it? Vicenza, two, two other banks. They've paid for them. How many billions? Somebody tell me. How many billions? Somebody. Claudio. Quanti billioni? How much? 30. 17. 17 billion euros. Nothing very much. Chicken feed. Nothing. So. Yes. And who pays this? Who will pay this? The Italian taxpayer will pay for it. So, less schools, less hospitals, less roads, less pensions. And here in Italy, you see, just look at the, look at this, the situation. We already talked about Greece. Yes. But Portugal and Spain are only one step behind Greece. And Italy is only one step behind Portugal and Greece. That's the truth. And Italy is not any country. It's the third biggest country of the Eurozone. And in Italy also nothing has been solved. There's a huge political crisis in Italy. Collapse of confidence in the existing parties. The communists can speak about that. And France is only one step behind Italy, by the way. So everywhere you look, there's instability now. If we come to Britain, that, that's very interesting. Only 12 or 18 months ago, Britain was probably the most stable country in Europe. Now it's one of the most unstable countries in Europe. One shock after another. The Scottish referendum. And by the way, the national question in Scotland is not resolved. So they'll break away from Europe which will lead to a severe crisis and falling living standards for a long time. And it is entirely possible, it's not clear, but it's possible that at some stage, not immediately I think, at some stage there will be a referendum and it's possible that Scotland will break away. After 300 years, which will cause a terrible crisis in Britain and in Scotland. This, this Brexit, by the way, can, can cause serious problems in Ireland. Where the border is a serious question, as you know. Border between uh, the South, which is an independent country, and the North, which is part of the United Kingdom. This, this border ceased to exist. It didn't exist. It, people go back and forth as if it didn't exist. But once they leave the EU, this border will have to be reconstructed. And that means that the whole nightmare of the national question in Ireland will be revived. It's quite, quite possible. But before I come to deal with, uh, with Britain, which we have to deal with, this changing consciousness was reflected in an opinion poll which Fred gave to me the other day. I think it was for young people, wasn't it? I think it was for young people which asked the following question. Would you be prepared to participate in an uprising to overthrow the government? Yes. With your permission, I will read the replies. Greece. People who said yes. Greece. 67%. No surprise. 
Italy, 65%. Spain, 63%. France, 61%. The next one is very interesting. Wales, 57%. Cumbria and Biff, long live Wales. <laughs> See, the Welsh are naturally revolutionaries. Uh, Switzerland, 44%, a bit less revolutionary than the Welsh. And Austria, 39%. Yeah, but think of the question would you participate in an uprising to overthrow the government? See, it shows that there's a fundamental change. And you've seen that recently in the extraordinary rise of Jeremy Corbyn. The result of the general election a, a couple of months ago was another political earthquake, which nobody expected this result. Nobody expected this result. The Labour Party was in a, a mess. Jeremy Corbyn was elected, by the way, by an accident. It was uh, an accident. How long ago was that, Adam? I can't remember. When we, pardon? Two years ago. Elected by, by a mistake, by an accident. But ever since then, he, he, he's connected with this same mood which exists everywhere, beneath the surface the apparent surface of tranquility everywhere. There is seething anger, indignation, above all frustration. The people want to do something to change this system. But they lack a, a point of reference. Jeremy Corbyn provided the point of reference. And the result was immediate, immediate. Hundreds of thousands of, of people, mainly young people, joined the Labour Party in order to support Jeremy Corbyn. Astonishing. What's the membership now? What was it before Corbyn? Uh, yes, it was the membership was 180,000 before Corbyn. 180,000. Now, it is 550,000. It's the biggest party in Europe. Although not, not all of them are active, it's true, but that shows. Coloss the colossal support. The right wing have done everything in their power to destroy Corbyn. The right wing, the Blairites, control the parliamentary Labour Party. A few months ago, they passed a, a motion of no confidence, well, 75%, wasn't it? They, they moved a vote of the, the, the MPs, members of parliament. A vote of no confidence in Jeremy Corbyn that got 75% support of, of the Labour MPs. 75% of those gangsters. Wanted to push him out. Well, you, you refused. In, in fairness, you remained firm. The, the press and television coverage have been a constant, for two years of constant, vicious attacks against Corbyn. And therefore, when, when Theresa May saw this, she's never been elected by anyone, by the way. She said, ah, we'll call an election. I'll get a big majority. The Labour Party will be utterly crushed. And there'll be no more Jeremy Corbyn. Marvellous. What, what, what more could you ask for? The opinion polls at that time 
gave the Conservatives an advantage, a lead, of 20 points, 20 percent. This is a huge lead. It's impossible to overturn a, a, a lead like that. Apparently. Apparently. But once the campaign started, Jeremy Corbyn held uh, meetings, public meetings. He was the only one that held public meetings. They were mass meetings. Enthusiastic meetings. Mainly of the youth. He appeared on television. He spoke quite well. And they put an extremely left-wing program. In terms of the British Labour Party, it was unprecedented. And he won in practice. The Labour Party didn't get a majority. But they wiped out the, the 20 points. They wiped out the, the majority of the Conservatives. Everyone was predicting a Conservative landslide. An avalanche, see. They were predicting a Tory majority of 200 seats. Majority. Instead, the majority is zero. It was a crushing defeat of the Conservatives, a crushing defeat. And for the mass media and for everybody, and for the, and for the right wing. And now, now Corbyn is the most popular politician in Britain. So much so, you know, there was this rock festival in Glastonbury. Have you heard of this festival, the Glastonbury Festival? Hands up who's heard of the festival. Yes, yes. Te terrible people. Horrible music. I think everyone, every member of the IMP should be obliged under the statutes to listen to classical music. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm waging a very successful struggle in the British Centre. I'm having some results. Converting the barbarians to Christianity. <laughs> but uh, where, where was I? <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn was invited to go to this festival. This is unprecedented. And it's a huge festival. How many people will be there? Pardon? 300,000 people, young people, 300,000. Rockers, you know, rockers. Tattoos and stuff like this. Funny hairdos. Bones in their noses, you know. 300,000 people. They've never invited any politician before in history. More people went to hear Jeremy Corbyn than any, any of, the, of the rockers. He had, no, he had more support than the Rolling Stones. <laughs> Even I can remember them. But, uh, no, but the, the point is this, a serious point. What this shows, or what, what all this shows, is that there's an enormous reserve of revolutionary potential everywhere. Especially in the youth, which is looking for an expression. They found it in Corbyn. We are orienting towards this movement naturally. We must, must be careful because in a skillful way we must explain the limitations of Corbyn's program. But you see, it shows the potential that exists everywhere. Now unfortunately I'm uh, running short of time and the world is a very big place. 
But we have to deal with the situation in the Middle East, which is, uh, it, it, it shows what Marx said. The choice before the human race is socialism or barbarism. You want to look at barbarism? Look at what's happened now in, in Mosul. And by the way, what disgusting hypocrisy these damned uh, bourgeois are, so-called Democrats. During the siege of Aleppo, they made a big fuss. Propaganda. We, we don't have any illusions in the, uh, the Assad regime, of course. All the Russians. But what they said, there was a lot of lies what they said. At least the Assad regime created corridors for people to leave. The reason that people didn't leave is that they were forced to stay by these jihadi bastards, these ultra-reactionary elements. But look at uh, Mosul. They don't say much about Mosul. Now they say a little bit about Mosul. Mosul has been completely destroyed. They complained about the Russians bombing uh, in Syria. But it, it, it's clear that they, they've obliterated the entire city of Mosul. Don't know how many people have been slaughtered. Men, women and children. And the problem has not been solved. Because let's see what happens now. The Turks are watching Mosul, which they consider to be their property by the way. Then there's the Kurds, they've got their own plans of course. And I don't know, then there's the Iranians. And I don't know how many factions there are inside uh, the Iraqi government. What has occurred in Syria is, is a monstrosity, there's no question about that. Originally there was a, a genuine revolutionary uprising against Assad. But that was very quickly turned into a, a reactionary movement of the worst sort. These jihadi madmen organized and financed by Saudi Arabia which is the center of counter-revolution in the Middle East. The most vicious, corrupt, cruel, degenerate regime you can imagine. See, the, the British government, by the way, has just suppressed the report. They refused to issue it. Into who finances jihadi uh, reactionary movements in Britain. We know the answer. The answer is Saudi Arabia, which they're deliberately concealing. But in Saudi Arabia also there's been a change. The old king, uh, Abdullah, wasn't it? He was a reactionary old bastard, of course. But he was cunning, he was cautious. He would never have been involved in this mess in, in Yemen. But there's a new regime, a new upstart now. Mohammed bin, bin Salman, isn't it? A, re, a real bastard. Ten times worse than the, the, the old guy. Who's launched adventures in, in Syria. But they've, where they've received a bloody nose because of the intervention of Russia and also Iran 
the, these jihadi monsters, they are monsters, have, have been thrashed, defeated, crushed. So he launches another adventure in Yemen. That's directed against Iran. And the, the, the joke is, if, it, if you can describe it as a joke, it's, it's a terrible tragedy. You'll you excuse me for saying this, and I'm sure you will forgive me. But of all the ruling classes in the world, the most ignorant, stupid, and incompetent are undoubtedly the Americans. They stormed into Iraq and wrecked the, wrecked the whole country, thereby destabilizing the whole of the Middle East. All the monstrosities and the crimes that have been committed subsequently are ultimate, ultimately due to this monstrous crime, the crime of imperialism. And they're still committing crimes. In Syria they back these jihadi madmen, the CIA, together with the Saudis. But they're being defeated. And they've, they've supported Saudi Arabia. Trump visited Saudi Arabia. Got, got on very well with these monsters. Of course, he had a lot of bad publicity at home. So he's very pleased to be received by the red carpet. He was even filmed doing this sword dance, you know, the sword. Did you see him? With, with the Saudi uh, monarchs, with, the, with swords, you know. Dancing the hokey cokey with the. <laughs> uh, I must confess, he didn't seem to, to know quite to do with this, what to do with this sword. <laughs> I thought he, he, he might have thought he was a golf club. He likes golf. I, w I was hoping, I was hoping that he might just take a swing <laughs> and chop off the head of the, of the crown prince, but he. <laughs> But unfortunately, he did not. Yes. This, in other words, the, the, these are the most counter-revolutionary forces in the world. But because of their... In Iraq, they destroyed the Iraqi army. They're so stupid, they didn't understand the effect of this. The Iraqi army was the counterbalance to the Iranian army. So when they destroyed the Iraqi army, naturally the Iranian uh, power has increased enormously. In effect, the Iranians control Iraq. There's a Shiite government. They've got a big influence in Syria, where they helped to win the war. They, they helped to win the war. They've got a big influence in Lebanon. And now the Americans, Trump is desperately trying to stop their uh, advance. I don't think he will, he will succeed. The, the Russians also, of course, have been involved. In reality, it's Russia that decides what happens now. In Syria. And the Yanks can moan as much as they like. But uh, Assad will remain in power as long as the Russians want him to be in power. In incidentally, the Saudi regime is in a deep crisis. Perhaps Hamid can intervene on this point. Because, uh, ironically, because of the falling price of petrol, of oil rather, which they're partly responsible for. I, I won't go into that. They've got a huge, for, for, the, for the first time, they've got a huge budget deficit in Saudi Arabia. 
They're cutting subsidies for food and so on for the Saudis. And they're involved in, in an unwinnable war in the Yemen, a very vicious war. I would, I would go so far as to say a, a, almost a genocidal war. They're, they're killing millions of men, women and children. Deliberately through starvation. Deliberately. And these nice civilized humanitarian democrats in the west I've got absolutely nothing to say about this genocide which they participating in supporting the Saudis giving them arms which they used to slaughter, slaughter people absolutely disgusting now I have to finish but before I do so, there's, there's one important subject, which now, as John reported, it will be discussed here in one of the sessions. And that is Venezuela. How, much, how long have we got, John? Left. Right, okay. In real time, at 10 minutes. This international can be proud of the role which we played in the Venezuelan Revolution. From the beginning, this was the only tendency in the world that recognized that it was a revolution. It was, there's no question about this. It was. If you read Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution, which I hope that you all will, Trotsky defines a revolution in the following way. A revolution is a situation which is not normal where the masses, that is to say the millions of ordinary men and women, begin to become active in politics and begin to take their destiny into their own hands. That was certainly the case in Venezuela. Which I've seen with my own eyes, as other comrades in this room can also uh, confirm. Hugo Chavez was a man that I knew quite well. He had a lot of respect for our tendency. I personally had a certain amount of influence on him. As he said himself. And I think, I believe that Chavez it was a remarkable man. Very honest. Very courageous. Fighter against imperialism and against injustice. He regarded himself, under our influence, he regarded himself as a Marxist. He spoke about Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky. About the need for world revolution. And I'll, I'll tell you what, Chavez was far to the left of anything in Europe. Anything. Far to the left of Corbyn. I would say that he was not, more than a left reformist, he was almost, you could say, that he was a centrist. Vacillating between reform and revolution. Reformism and revolution. But you see, this is the problem. Hugo Chavez was not really a Marxist. He was very confused. He tried to balance between different classes, which you cannot do. For example, he tried to buy off the military, to buy off the generals. To avoid the problem of taking on the state, which you can't do. 
as Lenin explains. A, so a genuine socialist revolution must destroy the old state. And in spite of many reforms, many good reforms which they did, they failed to do the fundamental task. I told Chavez this myself on more than one occasion. I've said it in mass meetings, in factories, to peasants, on television. I've repeated many times the same points. You cannot make half a revolution. And if you try to do so, you'll make a mess. And frankly, it would be better if you never started. I explained. Either we will expropriate the bourgeoisie in Venezuela and spread the revolution at least to South America, at least. Either we will destroy the bourgeoisie or the bourgeoisie will destroy us. There was never any doubt about that from the, from the word go. And as, because they didn't do this, Chavez was surrounded, well, that's one man, but he was surrounded by a mass of bureaucrats, corrupt elements, reformists, above all the disgusting Stalinists who played the pernicious counter-revolutionary role, to which I might add the pernicious role of the Cuban bureaucracy yes including Fidel Castro who never wanted a socialist revolution in Venezuela or anywhere else all they wanted was cheap oil and a friendly government in Caracas And this counter-revolutionary bureaucracy, Chavez actually used that expression many times. He talked about the counter-revolutionary bureaucracy. Yes, but he, he didn't uh, dismantle it. He didn't purge it, which he should have done. This counter, of course, has destroyed the revolution. Now you, now you see the result of trying to combine socialism and capitalism. You've got the worst of all worlds in Venezuela. On the one hand, the, the, the mess of the, the collapse of the market economy, sabotage of the counter-revolution, of course. And on the other hand, terrible corruption on the part of the bureaucracy. And together, these forces are strangling the Venezuelan revolution. Yes, but it's not, it's not yet the end of the story. It is astonishing, incredible to me that this revolution could have lasted as long as it did. Twenty years, this is incredible. I thought there'd be a, we thought that there'd be a, a counter-revolution long before this. And the only reason it's lasted for 20 years, and we must never forget this, is the colossal revolutionary energy and conviction and loyalty of the masses. Every time the counter-revolution reared its head, and it did, did that several times. The workers and the peasants and the youth and the women. Spontaneously rose up. And defeated the counter-revolution. In, uh, in the coup of 2000 and wasn't it? The coup of 2002 they actually took power 
And the masses rose up spontaneously. In 48 hours, they defeated this coup. They, they released Chavez, who was a prisoner. He would have been killed, I'm sure of it. The reaction that is, they fled like rats to the sewers, hid under the beds. The army generals, the bishops, the cardinal, the press, the newspapers, the television, the capitalists, the landlords. They were demoralized. I, at that moment, one word from Chavez, one single word. And that would, that would have been the end of capitalism in Venezuela. And yes, the beginnings of the World Socialist Revolution. There was nothing could have stopped it. Nothing. You'd have had a peaceful revolution. But that word never came. That word never came. And now you see the result. This, this so-called search for peace and peaceful reform and dialogue and where has it led? Now there will be violence. Now there is violence. Now there will be bloodshed. And the truth is civil war already exists in Venezuela. Forces of reaction are, are mobilizing. Hundred people have already died. And that's just the start of it. Now let's be clear. If the counter-revolution succeeds in Venezuela, just think. The ruling class will want to take revenge. After 20 years of suffering, as they would put it, humiliation, under the, uh, the rule of the workers and peasants, these ignorant, illiterate people took power out of our hands. They will seek revenge. It will not be a pretty picture, my friends. And therefore, and by the way, I should add to that, I should add, just think, the defeat of the Venezuelan revolution, despite all the, the mistakes and the errors and the distortions and the crimes of the, of the bureaucracy, would have a demoralizing effect on workers everywhere. It would encourage the forces of world counter-revolution And therefore, this international has a duty. We must mobilize the maximum forces, not to support Nicolas Maduro, who's a useless, I know, I know him quite well, he's a useless seller. Or this government which is responsible for the mess. It's a bit like the, the Bolsheviks policy which you'll discuss here in August 1917 when General Kornilov tried to overthrow the government the provisional government and what was the position of the Bolsheviks? of course no support for Kerensky no support for the provisional government that's not our position they're responsible for this. But the workers and peasants and soldiers must mobilize to defeat the main enemy, which is Kornilov. And when we've done that, we will settle accounts with Kerensky and his supporters in the labor movement, the Mensheviks and SRs. Communists, that's approximately the position which I'm putting to you. Jordi will explain what we propose. But we must mobilize our forces 
to defeat the counter-revolution in Venezuela, to assist our very good section that we have of comrades in that country. And you know, very often a defensive struggle can turn into an offensive struggle. Every section of this international can use this question because we are not a discussion club, you know. The purpose of this meeting is not just to discuss ideas, of course it is that. But it is also, once having accepted the ideas of Marxism, to translate those ideas into concrete action to develop the class struggle under the, band uh, under the, under the, the flag of internationalism. Therefore, I say to you, all forces at the point of attack of counter-revolution in Venezuela, Venezuela must not triumph. We must unite our forces with the workers and peasants fighting against reaction. As part of the broader struggle of workers and peasants and youth and women and all oppressed forces in society for that great and sacred goal, the socialist transformation of society and the future of mankind.